record this today because we record this for the marchers uh, so they can kind of stay up with what we're talking about. Does that follow you? Yes. Walk that one. <laughs> I'll, I'll move around in a minute, but tell me where we left off, would you? It moved against Title IX. That's where we are, Title IX? Yes. Okay. So number 20, Title IX. Now, I know uh, Austin Myrna really wanted to be here today because, you know, he's going to be a college athlete as well. But you guys remember um, you guys remember the 1964 Civil Rights Act when we talked about affirmative action? Oh, yeah. Okay. And, okay, you, here, we'll go ahead and get you on camera. Okay. What? Let, hey. let me lower it a little bit so everybody can get on camera. Oh, oh, oh. Over here. Over here. Hey. Okay. All right. We're good? How much good? did you pay for that? I didn't pay anything for it. School paid $500 or a speed stick. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a Bluetooth. Yes. Okay. Wow. So the 1964 Civil Rights Act and affirmative action. Okay. Okay, so one of these days, you guys will get over the technology and I can move on. Okay, sorry. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so uh, Title IX is of Title IX of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Okay. And basically what it says is that you have to have an equal number of scholarships for athletes for male and female students. Okay. Now, what this has done, what's up? I'm not trying to screw with the camera. Okay. What this has done is really helped women. Okay. Um, what it has also done is hurt some men. Okay. Now, I was talking to Coach Trail uh, at lunch. I just want to get my numbers right. Do you guys know how many scholarships a Division I football team has? Full rides? About uh, 20. Brayden? Do you know? Sure. 85. Full rides. Okay? Not per year, but per four years. Well, per year. You need to have a, per year. There's a new class that comes in. Yeah, some people graduate. You have 85. So if you have 85 players on your football team, all of them can have full rides. Jack, my son, went and threw it in Emporia State on Saturday. It's in front of the coaches, okay? Emporia State. It's a Division II, okay? The only scholarships Emporia State baseball has? Full scholarships? Now, the average, like Wichita State baseball, has a low. Okay? But they're carrying, you know, anywhere from, you know, 35 to 40 guys on the squad. Okay? Uh, you, know, you might travel with 25 or go to postseason with 27, something like that. Okay? But you only have 11. You know how many women's basketball has? 85. 12. How many girls are on the team? 12. Okay. So the problem here, guys, is college football. Now, college football is great. To me, it's, it's one of my favorite sports uh, to watch. And they've done very well this year like with ratings and stuff. College football makes money. Almost every other sport besides men's basketball loses money. Now, Wichita State women's volleyball is in the top 10 in attendance in the country. So they actually probably make some money at Wichita State volleyball. But that's a rarity. Most programs lose money. I mean, think about college track and field. You've got all the travel. You've got all the uniforms, the coaches and everything. You think they bring in enough people to watch the track and field or cross country uh, to break even? Why do they do no. that? They don't. Okay. Well, why do we do athletics, period? Well, I mean, you can just do athletics. Clubs. It's a way to get people into your, into your school. So it doesn't pay for Maybe by attracting the market. Not if they're on a full ride. Well, no, for, for Wichita State baseball, yeah. 
brings in a lot of money as students paying to play sports. Paying to play sports. Okay, so here's the deal. If you have 85 football players, that means you need 85 women on scholarship, right? To balance off football. Then you have all the other sports. Yes? So what you got to do is you got to come up with more women's scholarships and more women's sports to offset having other male, male sports. And the biggest victim of Title IX has been college wrestling. Coach Stovall that started coaching, what used to coach here, was a Division I wrestler at LSU. He showed up for school his sophomore year, and the coach had a meeting. He said, guys, we got to have a meeting. And the coach informed them that they were shutting down the wrestling program at LSU because of Title IX. Northern Iowa, which uh, is in the Missouri Valley, um, about six years ago, shut down their baseball program because of Title IX. Now, what it has done really well is our women's athletics in the United States is better than any in the world. If you look at the Olympics, there's no team, male or female, from any country that wins more medals than American women, including American men. American women dominate on a global scale. So, what you're doing in helping women is at the detriment of some men. I mean, but it's kind of worth it. Our women won FIFA. Won the World Cup. I mean, we're good at everything. Our women are good at everything. Yeah. So is that because of how that? I think it helps, definitely. Now, if you want a scholarship, need some money to go to school, golf. There are hundreds of women's golf scholarships in this country that go unused every year because there's not enough women playing golf. But they have scholarships for it. So all you got to do is get some clubs. Can I just get a sex change? And yeah. Start yeah. I'm sure that'll work. For a women's scholarship? Mm -hmm. Wait, would that actually work? If you just said identify as a woman? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it worked in the Olympics. It might. In a perfect world, guys, you could just take football and say, okay, football's an anomaly. It makes money. In fact, football helps fund all the other sports. You know what I mean? Because all the money that these big schools bring in, it helps pay for the other sports. But if you look at KU, they have women's rowing. There's scholarships for that. Now, how many of you guys know girls around here that row for a hobby? <laughs> You do? Yeah, we're back at she's uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm back, back at collegiate. And I, yeah. Uh, still got like a four ride to kick state on run. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't even have to be a rower. You just got to be a certain height and a certain athletic ability. I mean, she was a rower. But yeah. But we've had girls from Carroll give, give <laughs> scholarships to KU for rowing that were not rowing. They were just good athletes and tall. Huh? Yeah, yeah. It's all, it's hard work. Um, yeah, Alex. You know Brock Lubers. I don't know if you. Have I know that name. name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Swimmer. Yeah, he's a swimmer. And yeah. He gave him like good chunk of money to go row at WSU. To row? Yeah, he's never rowed before though. Never rowed. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a tough call, guys. Um. I mean, I have a daughter, and she's an athlete, and if she wants to play college sports, there's going to be opportunities for her that were not there for prior to Title IX being enforced. Uh, Title IX came, comes in 1964. It's really not enforced until the 1980s. They really start cracking down on it and making sure that, you know, we're equal. Um, it also bleeds down into high school as well as far as, like, facilities go. So like anything you do for baseball, you got to do for softball and, and, and so forth. Um, so it's equality. Um, I mean, you could do this on an economics, um, 
you know, doing it based on economics, say, okay, well, which sports bring in money? Uh, male sports or female sports, which ones bring in more money? Well, those are the ones that should get scholarships. Um, not based on just an arbitrary number or a quota system. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, college athletics um, really, uh, I mean, <coughs> athletics in general, guys, help people be more rounded. Um, now, not everybody's an athlete, but it doesn't mean it's not good for people. Um, high school athletics is really good for keeping kids off the streets, keeping them busy after school, not just being keeping busy and disciplined, but health-wise, you know, being active is good for you. So I think uh, anything we can do to increase participation in, in group activities like this is good. Um, there's good effects for society. So. Um, I think, you know, uh, as far as Title IX goes, you kind of got to decide between, um, you know, hurting a few guys that play baseball and wrestle and um, for, the, for the betterment of women, um, then you would say no. If you're like, uh, this is crap, uh, it's not fair, um, then you say, uh, I'm against Title IX. Yeah. Do you know why Wichita State hasn't started another football program then? So you're saying it's one of the most profitable. Yeah, uh, well, it's really expensive to get off the ground. Um, and then you're looking at, is this like running out of juice or what? You're looking at, um, are, are people going to show up? I mean, is it going to make money? Uh, it's a long process to become that Division I football program again. So you'll start at a, like a D2 level or NCAA Division II or 1A or whatever they call it. I mean, there, there's that process uh, to go through. And then you got the stadium. I don't know about you. You've been in the stands at Cessna? I would not feel safe being at the top of those stands with a full of people. Personally, I'm not going to the top. I'm sitting as low to the ground as possible. Have you seen how that structure's built? Have you been to Cessna Stadium? Huh? Full of people? I don't know. It scares me. Huh? Have you gone underneath? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen them. They're like, yeah. Okay. All right, you decide. What's next? In favor of court reform, court in medical malpractices. Okay. All right. Anytime you guys hear this term tort, okay, Jack, you're thinking about law, right? Yeah. Okay. So tort is like civil law. Yes. Yeah, okay. It's a civil right. Or civil, yeah, lawsuit. Okay. So when we're talking about malpractice, medical malpractice, uh, you get your proverbial. Um, where a doctor um, is negligent, they don't uh, they don't diagnose an obvious problem that leads to something worse. Or you get into a surgical situation where, say, somebody goes in for a, a surgery, an ulcer in their stomach, they open them up, and then a sponge falls in, and then they sew them back up. And the, did you guys? I mean, there's a new TV commercial about a cell phone falling into somebody. Have you seen that commercial? Yeah. That ran the other night. We were watching something. They showed it like 10 times. Stupid commercial. But um, So the, the pain and suffering that is involved in, you know, this, this sponge that gets left in the body, and that's actually happened before. And so it gets infected, and then you have to do another surgery to remove it. You miss work, so you have to recoup, you know, what you lost in, in pain and suffering and then lost wages and so forth. So you sue the doctor. You sue the hospital. Okay. Um, let me give you another scenario. Uh, let's say you go in, you have diabetes and uh, circulation to your right leg is really bad. Your foot falls asleep and you wait to go to the doctor too long and you go into the doctor and they say, we're going to have to amputate your right foot. So you go in for surgery to get your right foot amputated, 
and uh, they make a big mistake, and instead of amputating your right foot, they amputate your left foot. That happened right on this. <laughs> okay, so, so now, now you have no feet. <laughs> how, do you, ooh, yeah, how do you calculate a lifetime of having no feet? Right. Well, does it matter how old the patient is? I mean, let's say the patient is 80 versus a patient that's 15 years old. I, mean, I think people should be compensated for the fact that they now have no feet. They can't enjoy life um, near the standards they were. Tristan. Yes, they have to be compensated, but how much is the question? <laughs> a lot. How much? I would be pissed if I lost I mean, most of my feet. No, I, I can't know. run anymore. Like, okay, okay, okay. Like, okay what's, what's five the, million. What's the defense? Five million? That's probably cool. Oh, that's fine. I can do. I can work in a wheelchair at no, a desk. No, no, I'm five not good. Good. <laughs> 50 million. We got fifty million over here. Oh, five million. I, I think. How much? I can get a business it's off the ground. Look, look, pain and suffering. 16 million. Pain and suffering would be incomplete. Did you say 16? 16 over here. Right. Each foot is worth 5 million, all right? So okay. Well, one you weren't going to have. I know. Yeah. One I wasn't going to have. So they cut off one. That's 5 million right there. Okay. So here's the thing. If this goes to a jury, okay, it's a jury trial, and you have this really bad sob story that's going on with this person's life has been ruined by this accident. It's been ruined by having no feet. <laughs> so a jury, and juries tend to be very uh, giving in these situations. Sympathetic. So yeah, so so sympathetic to the point of, let's say, $25 million. Okay. Punitive damages. Stop, stop. $25 million. Now. To a doctor. To a doctor in the hospital. Now, who is going to pay that $25 million? No, they're not. The banks. No, they're not. The insurance company that insures the doctor in the hospital is going to pay that $25 million. Now, what's going to happen to the premium that doctors and hospitals have to pay to the insurance companies? Their insurance for the doctors and hospitals is going to go up, which means they're going to have to charge more for what? Everything else. Everything else. For, for health care, they're going to have to raise prices. So the doctors and hospitals can afford to pay their insurance. You're saying liability since it isn't on the doctor. Doctors can mess up. That's right. Right. So they have in doctors have to have liability insurance, so do hospitals. So what is tort reform of that? This means putting caps on the amount of settlements that somebody can get for a malpractice lawsuit. So you put a cap on it, you say you can give no more than $5 million for any case. Question. $5 million. Go. Is there a law that prevents the insurance company uh, from refusing to insure the... Uh, a doctor in a hospital? A doctor in a hospital. Yeah, I mean, they could refuse insurance. So why don't they just do that? So why don't they... Well, the, the hospital and the doctor cannot practice without insurance. Well, yeah, so that... That doctor would bear the cost of his actions. Okay, yeah. I mean, but really, no, like one foot. You know how many mistakes are made in Via Christie every year? That could result in lawsuits? But not not like that. Not like, like, you know, I'm, I don't cut off the wrong arm every day. Okay, okay, but there are mistakes every made day. that can result in lawsuits. These lawsuits, if they get in front of a jury, are going to result in very high payouts. Are you following me? So, one solution through statistic analysis, guys, you can figure out roughly how many mistakes are going to happen a year, and insurance companies that insure doctors and hospitals have an idea of what worst case scenario this is what we're going to pay out each year. And they can get their health care premiums or the insurance premiums under control, which lowers health care costs for everyone. Yes? with, say, my mother had a brain tumor, and they were going to do some, some brain surgery on her, but it was high risk, and they told me it was high risk, and she died. Could I sue on that basis? You could try, but that's probably not going to work. Okay. Now, what could happen is if they went in for surgery for a brain tumor, and they administered the wrong anesthetic, okay, and it killed the patient even before the surgery, then you've got a lawsuit on you. 
Okay, so that's a wrongful death. Wrongful death. Can you put a price tag on a human life? My mother? Yes, Ooh. you can. Yes, yes, can. Well, yeah. we'll sure try, Mr. Ebert. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, do you want to continue to see health care costs continue to rise in this country? Or would you like to do something to maybe stabilize it? If you can put caps on these lawsuits, then you can stabilize health care costs in certain ways, okay? But this, yeah, like, say I'm permanently disabled by the spinal surgery yes. gone wrong. I expect my whole entire life, the rest of my life, right. to be covered. We've by already health. done this, okay? We've already had this discussion, Tristan. There's going to be enough money for you for the rest of your life. I mean, $5 million is is probably going to come pretty close. It may need to be higher than that. Is it going to come to lost wages and the emotional trauma that the right. client has undergone? <laughs> You've got to come up with a number, okay? Now, the, the one on, on wrongful death is difficult because you could be talking about a six-year-old or a 60-year-old, okay, where a six-year-old in a wrongful death case, I mean, that, that child had their whole life ahead of them, where a 60-year-old's on the backside. Of life, so you have a different number for the younger person. Pretty sure all the fluids in the human body are worth about seventy-nine cents. So okay. What is worth? I can't. I don't know if I can continue. Maybe I should have taped first hour. <laughs> just show. Just show us. What is your bread? Yeah. Right, so you, I mean, you need common sense here. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, I hear you. What you're saying, um, it's it's not going to be perfect. Um, but if we can put some caps on certain things, then insurance companies know worst case scenario what they're going to have to pay out, which allows them to bring doctors and hospitals liability insurance under control allowing them to not have to charge as much. Now, most of these lawsuits, guys, are settled out of court. They don't want these, lawyers for these insurance companies do not want these to go to a jury. So they're usually gonna settle, how much do you want? How much will, to, to make this case go away, we'll write you a check. Okay, that's normally what happens, okay? Yes? So this court reform explicitly Explicitly means caps on certain types of lawsuits for malpractice, medical malpractice lawsuits. Caps on the amount of damages that can so be like awarded. It wouldn't mean caps on everything. Um, like, it, it doesn't have to mean that. It doesn't have to, but I mean, what are we trying to get to ultimately? And that is bringing down the cost of insurance. We're trying to get Do I have that on here? Okay, I don't know. I'm pretty sure you mentioned it sometime. I, I took it off of here because. Okay. Number 22. The U.S. government is too big and it spends too much. That's all right. I, I don't even think it. Is it recording? I think it's dead. I think it's still recording, though. I did charge it this morning, but for 45 minutes. All right, so anyhow, this is a general question based on what you know of your government. Does it, is it too big? Does it spend too much? It's not big enough, and it needs to spend more on this. <laughs> well, there you go. Then say no. The government is in my life. The government needs to do more to solve your problems and the problems of this country. Next, drill for oil 
in the Gulf of Mexico and Anwar. Well, guys, as part of the tax plan, under uh, over here in Alaska, it's called the Alaskan National Wildlife Refuge. And for many years, it has been off limits for drilling for oil. Now, do we drill for oil in Alaska already? Yeah. Yes, we do. Okay. We have a pipeline, actually, that runs down from Alaska through Canada into the United States. There's some Indian reservations. Now. Hey, hey, just a few, just a few. Now. Anwar is open. It just got open. Now, the Gulf of Mexico, guys, out here, there is a lot of oil. You remember the BP spill? Yeah, I think that was, that was a cautionary. Yeah, you remember the nine, the name of the rig? It's called Deepwater Horizon. Horizon. Yeah, it was a movie. With Mark Wahlberg. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, it's way out here in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Why is it way out there in the deep water? Because the law says you can't drill closer to shore. Okay, so it's deep water. So when the thing busted. So much oil leaked out because it was so hard to close it because it was in deep water. Okay? That's right. Now, there is oil off the coast of Florida. Okay, now, what's the biggest industry in the state of Florida? Tourism. Tourism. So, do you want to go to St. Pete Beach or Clearwater Beach or Pensacola Beach and look out and see an oil rig? few hundred yards out into the water. Hell yeah, that's yes. America. <laughs> that's how you know you're getting money. And if there's a spill, that would ruin those beaches forever. We could we could take the cost, Mr. Right? But if it's in shallower water, it'd be easier to turn it off, right? Yeah. Well, easier, right. easier clean up, easier to turn off. Also, also, you know, yeah, they're also close to the reef. <laughs> kill a lot of now, kill a lot of if you're at the beach and you look out, you can see one of these wells. That's, you know, within three miles, you'll be able to see. Okay. Can we do three and a half miles off the beach so that we can get this oil that's underground here? No, no more oil, Mr. Ebright. Look, I, for oil. one, like being dependent on Middle Eastern oil. I don't know about the rest of you. I'm pretty okay with it. Yes. It seems like it's a sure thing. Yes. But we're going to simply drill all the oil. Guys, not in the next century. Exactly. Like, like, what? I plan on dying before we run out of oil. Guys, there is so much oil in the shale underneath the United States to last for 100 years. No more oil. And by that time, like, I'm sure Elon Musk has really done some fracking. Fracking. That causes earthquakes. Fracking. So what? Frack the people with who cares about earthquakes? Hey, man, it's a midnight massage. Uh, all that sounds like is the government trying to kill the citizens right. with earthquakes by using fracking. This is what we're going to do. No more oil. I want you to add up your yeses and noes. Add up your yeses and noes. Well, fill them in. Did you add them up? Okay, you don't have to participate in this if you don't want to. Uh, I like to kind of know where my students sit politically. Uh, but let's start with, did anybody have 16 or more yeses? One, two, three. Okay, 
Okay? You're reactionary. Don't raise your hand again. Okay? Did 14 or more yeses. Fourteen or more no's. Sixteen or more no's. <laughs> Chantel, are you playing? Are you playing? Okay. All right. Obviously, we don't have our full class here today. Okay. All right. Sixteen or more yes. <laughs> conservative all right. Hey, don't okay. put me with those moderates. Conservative. Don't put me with okay. the moderates. Which means right wing. Okay. And of our si people that had 16, did anybody, any of you that had 16 or more have 18 or more? Oh. <laughs> 19? Neoconservative fascism. Yeah. Yep. All right. Chris's avatar on that website. It's a big anime. Yeah. The higher this number goes, the more right wing extreme you are. Okay? 16 to 16. Chris, you want to start hanging out some more? I just did. I'm not Labeled you a Republican. I'm not. Just to confirm Republican. I'm not. You are a Republican. Now, there are different levels of this, guys, obviously. Um, and this is a, a place where you find a lot of Bishop Carroll students in here. Okay. I'm not a Republican. Yeah, well, you align, your ideas align with the Republican That's Party. so well, sad. You don't have to be a Republican. I just voted against laws on this, like gun control laws. Why do we need gun control laws? It sounds like a thing Republican would say. It sounds like a thing Republican would say, Tristan. Now you really have an issue right with that one. All right. These people in here are moderates. Officially moderate. Okay. This is the fence. Okay, that people I'll sit on. Okay. There's more, there's more parties than just Republicans. Hey, I'm not done yet. Will you chill out? Okay? Yeah. Let me finish. Yeah. I have a lot more to talk about. Hey, right. Mr. Ebright, would it be technically against school school conduct for me to gag him until we're done? Yes. Ah, Okay, this is your mainstream Democrat. Yeah. Okay, and then down here you're getting more liberal. Wait, Mr. Wright, what if you have more than 16? Socialist. Whoa. <laughs> what if you have more than 16, Mr. Okay. What if you have more than 16? You're leaning towards socialism. Okay. What if I have? What if there's all of them is no? Now, we did you have 16? Huh? Okay. Now, all right. Now, guys, this is your basic two-party talk, okay? Uh, Left and right, okay? But it goes deeper than that. Now, the, the main, you know, the basics here, shh, the basics here is an ability to understand the difference between left and right, Okay? left and right when it comes to politics. I, in understanding that the right tends to align itself with the Republican Party, and the left tends to align itself with the Democratic Party. Okay. We are in a two-party system, and I'm going to explain to you as we go through this class, guys, why we are kind of locked in this two-party system. Because of the first past the okay. voting system. Now, it's Xander Hamilton and Now, on the sheet we just worked on, 
you can classify many of the topics into two categories, pocketbook issues and bedroom issues, okay? Bedroom meaning social, social issues, okay? Now, when you look at the two parties, okay, let's start with the Republicans. Republicans tend not to want to get into your pocketbook, tend to be for lower taxes, less government spending, less redistribution of wealth, okay? So they're not really into this. But when it comes to bedroom issues or social issues, Republicans tend to want to legislate morality to some extent. Now, you can't, I think it's generally knowledgeable, you can't legislate morality, but you can pass laws that encourage certain behaviors, like marriage, for instance. If taxes are lower for married people that file jointly, or to have more children, you would give tax credits to families that have more children. You get to write off the taxes. That's promoting family, okay? These are types of things Republicans are for. Um, uh, you know, laws against abortion, okay? Uh, gay marriage, these sorts of issues tend to be kind of important socially to Republicans. Does that make sense? On the other side, Democrats tend to want to get into your pocketbook and redistribute wealth and do more with that money or do good with that money in their eyes. Is that this is the role of government is to get into your pocketbook and use that money for good. Okay, that means more social programs, government doing more for people. Here in the bedroom, Democrats tend to say, it's none of your business, okay? It's, you know, freedom to abort babies, uh, freedom to gay marriage. What you do in your bedroom is no business of the government, okay? Now, libertarians, <laughs> basically this. They don't feel that the government should do much of anything. It's not the role of government to redistribute wealth, to take care of people. It's not the role of government. The role of government is to have a police force, a fire department, and maybe build some roads uh, and a military in case we get invaded. Uh, but other than that, uh, that's what the government does. Uh, and the government has no business telling you how to live your life what to do with your body. If you want to uh, smoke pot, that's your, that's your prerogative. It's not the government's role to tell you what you put in your body. It's your life. Liberty, freedom. Libertarians believe in economic and social freedom. Okay, and this is very attractive to some people. Um, I like libertarians personally. I do have a couple of issues with the libertarians, okay? Libertarians tend to be, um, <laughs> isolationist in foreign policy. So if we were to add a third column here, okay? A hawk or a dove, right? Which ones are, which parties tend to be more hawkish, like more aggressive militarily and foreign policy wise? Okay. It's Republicans it's tend to be a little more hawkish. Republicans and Democrats both. Some. Pretty hawkish. Yeah, I mean, like Hillary, for instance, I think you could you call her a, a hawk <laughs> rather than a dove. Now, John Kerry, more of a dove. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, I would say there's more doves in the Democratic Party than hawks but they are not without hawks, okay? So this is kind of a, a wash, okay? Now, these are doves, okay? Libertarians tend to be very isolationist, uh, not involving themselves in other people's business, okay? And libertarians also tend to be pro-choice when it comes to abortion, okay? Because of that individual freedom thing, okay? So 
that's where I might run into a little bit of issue personally with the libertarians. Okay, yeah. So they mean that in the sense that they don't believe it's the government's role to control you in that sense. Mm -hmm. But if, say, they had, they were affiliated with some kind of religious belief, they're going to have that their own, but they're not going to try to enforce it on anybody right. else. Right, exactly. And, and so they're saying that the government doesn't have the, the right to do that. I guess the rule yeah, is the, it's not the power of the government. We don't want to give the government that power over our bodies. And, you know, I have heard of libertarians that are pro-life, um, but it kind of conflicts with the the party's message of individual freedom. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can argue it both ways because uh, if you're if you're a libertarian, it means you believe in uh, like freedom from any type of oppression. So, like, you could argue that killing a child in the womb is oppression of that child. I agree. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, where, where are the child's rights? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, uh, you know, that it kind of gives you a good take, though, on libertarians. Um, and so conservatives tend to be very libertarian when it comes to these issues, okay? And Democrats are very libertarian when it comes to these issues, okay? And so you kind of have a mix, all right? Um, What if you don't have a party? What if none of the two political parties or third political party um, don't represent your views? Pirate party. Where do you go? Communists. Uh, anarchy. Okay. Freedom. Speaking of communists. Next to Rockville. Are they a tech word for both? Okay, so guys, here's the wing, there's the moderates on the fence, okay? Okay, to the right, Republicans, conservatives, reactionary, okay? And then out here, to the left, Democrats, Liberals, socialists, and communists. Okay. Guys, this yeah, this is what most people will teach you. Okay? This is your classic left wing, right wing. Okay? Tristan, yeah. it's hard for me to talk. Okay. All right. Now, in, in any points you want to bring up, bring them up. Just try and keep it in the context. And when I finish, take it to a different topic if you have them. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is the fence. Most Americans are in here. This is where most of us are. Okay. Now, some would say that the United States is a center-right country where it leans a little bit more like this, yeah. okay? Now, you're looking at about 20% of the population that classify themselves as liberal, all right? Conservatives are more about 15%, okay? Now, where does Donald Trump land on this, the President of the United States? The answer is we don't know. We really don't. Okay, he has no political history that we can look back at and say, well, he voted this way on this, he voted that way on that. We don't know. Okay, now to this point, the only major piece of legislation that's happened under President Trump has been the tax cut. Okay, and that was fairly conservative. All right, now the border wall, okay, which he's been advocating for, I mean, guys, if you're on Facebook, you can go to Facebook and pull up video clips of Hillary Clinton, some of the most liberal members of Congress, talking about building a wall throughout the 1980s and 90s and the early 2000s, okay? It's used as a political tool today to just be critical of President Trump 
to just talk about, well, this wall is racist or this wall is that, it's this and that. Well, guys, the majority of the American people support border security. I mean, that's left and right. Okay, so now here's, a, here's where it gets a little bit confusing and a little bit of a fallacy. This becomes a little bit of a fallacy because people like to talk about fascism is only on the right, the far right. And communism is only on the far, far left, which there is some truth to that. But in your book, I think it's page six where we did the... Uh, the, the uh, current events quiz, or the, I think it's page six. There's a graph I have on there, and it's in a circular manner, okay? And in the middle up here, there's your moderates, there's the fence, get off the fence, okay? Now, to the right, Republicans, to the left, Democrats. Going further, you get your conservatives and your liberal, okay? But when you get to the bottom here, where fascism and communism meet, you have a lot in common between the two. Okay, they have much more in common than they have separate. Like both tend to end up as what? Dictatorships. Dictatorships. Both end up as totalitarian systems where there's a willingness to violate the law to get what they want and what I mean by the law is to violate the Constitution that is established in these countries which means overthrowing a government like Lenin did okay or uh, Mao did okay or slowly changing the system okay uh, into violating the Constitution this kind of Hitler did Hitler manipulated the Constitution of Germany to come to power using Article 48 of the Constitution against itself, allowing for a uh, basically a police state or martial law. And then he got dictatorial powers. Okay, He was a fascist. But him and Stalin share a lot in common. They both killed a lot of people. Now, liberals and conservatives tend to not to kill a lot of people, do they? So this is a little bit more accurate than your left-wing, right-wing thing. Are you following me? Yes? This makes more sense. Okay, but it, it's just so much easier to say left and right. Now, I heard Tristan in the back talking about classical liberalism. What we learn, guys, in this class is that the classic, classical liberals are people like Thomas Jefferson, James Madison. The founding fathers of this country were classical liberals. This liberal liberty means freedom. Okay? Modern liberals are different. They might mean social freedom, but certainly not economic freedom. If you know what I mean. You know what I mean? Okay. So this is this is a better way to kind of look at the political spectrum. Now, how many of you guys think you were uh, the same as your parents? Most people tend to follow their parents politically. Okay. Not always. Okay. But it is something that uh, tends to happen. Now, if you feel comfortable with this, this is something you could try out on mom or dad and see where they stand on these issues. Now, you might have to explain some of these to them because they may not be familiar with all these issues as well. I mean, how many of your parents know the history of Chiang Kai-shek, Mao Zedong, and Taiwan? I know my wife does it. Okay. So you you know what I mean. You, you'd have to kind of explain it to. Them. But it is interesting to try out on mom or dad and kind of see where they fall and whether they fall in the same realm as you. Okay. Now uh, in your book, 
there is um, another one of these tests. On my copy, the thing got cut off. Um, what page is that? Nine. Nine. So page eight, you kind of see some names uh, put here with it. Um, going through that one, and then on, uh, what page is that? Eleven. See some of the names on page eleven at the bottom. So I have a moderate. Colin Powell. A lot of you don't know who he is. Uh, Bill Clinton was pretty moderate as a president. Uh, then you go left. You get Hillary, Al Gore, Ted Kennedy, Jesse Jackson. To the right, uh, I, Mitt Romney's not a conservative. Uh, I'd put him more as a moderate. Uh, very conservative, Ronald Reagan. I don't know if, how many of you guys know who Glenn Beck is or Rush Limbaugh. Those guys are very conservative. Okay. Um, so, is that helpful in understanding the difference between left and right and maybe where you stand in the political spectrum? Okay.